And so if we begin with Genesis 25. So Genesis 25, 22 to verse 26, we'll start with that. So this is this is about Jacob's um early years in a home. Um so we're just gonna cover his early years in a home. Um, you know, from his birth up until um the, you know the act of his deception. So we're just gonna cover that his that history. Um so let's begin with verse twenty two of ch chapter twenty five. And the children struggled together within her. So prior to this we know that um you know Jacob's parents is Isaac and Rebecca and um we won't cover the previous history um i'm assuming we're kind of familiar with that history and how isaac and rebecca came together so let's just get straight to the point where you know you know rebecca was pregnant and then you know she gave birth to two twins so and the children struggled together within her and she said if it be so why am i thus and she went to inquire of the lord um, so, sorry, when she said that, what did she mean? Why am I thus? Why is that struggle going on inside her? Yeah. So why is this struggle? Why is this? Why is this? Why is she feeling this inside of her? So she. So she was very um, intuitive of what was going on in her. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So she goes to the Lord to inquire. What? Okay. What is this going on inside me? And um, and the Lord said unto her. <sighs> Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So God gives an explanation of what's going on, um, by explain, explaining that there's two nations in your womb, there's two manner of people, one shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her day is to be delivered but fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red, all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was three score years old when she bared him. So, um, so now, so we have two twins, we have two boys, Isaac. Oh, sorry, Jacob and Esau. Um, so, let's talk about a bit about Jacob then. So, what's the first thing we know about Jacob? What is he doing? What's happening in What's happening in the womb? He's taking hold of Esau's heel, He's holding on to his heel. Yeah. So there's a wrestle going on. So. Mm -hmm. Jacob is known for wrestling, you know, like what you said, he's holding on to Esau's heel. Um, whatever that looked like, but that's how the Bible describes it. So he's known for holding on, throughout Jacob's life, he's known for holding on to things. So we see at the beginning, he's holding on to Esau's heel. And then later on in the story, we we'll see him holding on to um, the birthright. Um, and last... We see him holding on to the angel when he's wrestling with the angel and he's refusing to let him go until he gets what he wants. Mm. So Jacob is a man who he gets what he wants. If, when he, if, this, if, this, if there's something what he wants, he puts his mind to it and he gets it. Whether it's for good or for bad or whatever it may be. But um, he's named by his behavior. So his name, his name means supplanter or heel holder. Let's begin then with who are we? Who wants to read this part? Yeah, I can read it if you want. Yeah. Who are we? In this story of Jacob and Esau, it tells us the story of our <coughs> We tend to look at things <coughs> from an internal perspective. If we can look internally and see that I am Jacob, his experience is my experience. This is just not another story where we can see failures and victories of God's people and prophetic applications for the times we're living in. But there are also lessons in there that teach you about yourself 
and how you relate with the experiences of the Bible characters. So, looking in, looking into the story, it tells us when we zoom into the story, it tells us who we are, and um, in my experience, you know, from studying these stories, I started to see myself as you know what I want to look internally in, in these stories and see myself as Jacob. This is my experience, and it's just not another story of God's people going through failures and victories, but. I believe that there are lessons that teach you about yourself and how you can relate with the experiences of you know the Bible characters. So so what is the first thing we know about Jacob? So in this story we see Jacob's life has evolved evolved around Esau. He is struggling in the womb. He come he comes out holding onto the heel of Esau. So in the Bible, we know that somebody's character is marked by their name. This is why later on in the story, Jacob's name is changed from Jacob to Israel because of the experience that he had with God. Um, the prior, prior to that name change, his experience is explained in the definition of his name. So we, 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 we went through that. From the birth up until his encounter with Christ at Jabbok, I don't know the exact amount of years, but I know it's, it's over 90 years. But um, if you take notice, you know, in Jacob's experience, we see that Esau had, um, had, a, had an impact upon Jacob's life for all these years. From the struggle in a womb, in a home, you know, the pattern to take hold of what Isaac was given to Esau, the, the deception on Isaac, you know, then the threat of Esau, and now it, it, Jacob, you know, going on a run from Esau and now Jacob's being an outcast and he goes to the land of the east and lives with his relatives you know then he starts a family but he stays there in fear because of fearing that Esau will find him and kill him you know so that prevents him from like moving on you know then he then then he gets called to go back home but then he has to confront his fear he has to confront Esau you know so he's led to a place where he has to, he's got no other choice but to confront it. Yeah, so um, so that's kind of a summary of Jacob's life and how Esau played a huge role in it. And that's like over 90 years. So I just imagine how one person can have an impact on your whole life. And you probably don't, you probably won't even realise it. So, um, Genesis 25. Yeah. Yeah, can you relate with that, CJ? Yes, uh, I mean it, it's um, it's quite uh, <clears throat> quite a thought that one person can have an impact on many. I mean, a lot of people's lives. Mm. So Genesis twenty-five, twenty-seven, and twenty-eight. Um, and the boys grew and Esau was a cunning hunter a man of the field and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents and Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison but Rebekah loved Jacob so can you what, what can you describe Esau his character compared to Jacob can we see the contrast or the differences? If we kind of look into verse 27. Yeah, it seems like he's more of an outdoor, exciting adventurer. He's a cunning hunter, Esau. And in contrast to Jacob, he seems to stay at home and live in the tent. And we see from this that um, Isaac is drawn to the character of Esau. Even though when we know anything about Isaac, he seems very much a quiet, stay-at-home kind of person. Well, we don't hear much about him. And in contrast, Esau's the one out and about. But he yeah. likes to eat the venison that Esau gets. Yeah. And we see from this that they have favourites, that Isaac loves Esau. Yeah. Rebecca loves Jacob. And we can see how that shapes them. 
and how important it is how the parents treat the children because it shapes their, their whole interaction it really has impact in their lives permanently and damaging really. yeah so Esau was a conning so conning um, in the definition I got on Google was having or showing skill in achieving one's end by deceit or evasion but when you look into the strongs you know you'll the words that come up is like um, being able to understand to discover to discern knowing when you look when you look at the word the strongs word um, when you put it in search the majority of the words that come up is knowing you know um so it it was a it was a skillful hunter, and this is probably one of the reasons why Jacob was fearing him most when he was on the run because he knows that Esau's a hunt is a man is a he knows how to hunt down his prey, you know he, he knows how to hunt. So Jacob was a hunted man. That's why, that's probably why he was so fearful and stayed where he was just in case Je Esau would find him because maybe he had the skill to kind of. Hunt out his prey, and Jacob was a prey. So, Jacob was a plain man. That plain man, that plain means complete, gentle, um, perfect, plain, undefiled, upright. So, this is the description we get of, of Jacob, and we contrast that to Esau. Two different personalities, two, two different characters, two different children. And the mother was drawn to the plain and perfect and undefiled one who stayed at home. And the father was drawn to the outgoing, the man who doesn't stay at home, is a man of the field, is out hunting and doing whatever he does. And this is what Isaac was drawn to. So, um, if we go to this quote, EP113.3. Just before you go there, it seems like in that description that you know that Jacob is a righteous, upright one, and he saw it's a bit dodgy. You know, he's a bit sorry, I'm trying to not express it, but he's a cunning hunter. He's not very nice. He's a bit. It says he's a skinner to the one's end where the seed or is aging. When we start unraveling the story of Jacob, you know his name means the planter, and you said that he, he really wants to get hold of something, he'll get it. And we see that how he gets it when we see these stories that he actually has to seek as well. He's the same. In what in many ways that you saw he's a cunning hunter but for different things, not for animals, but for his birthright, for his wife, for his flocks, whatever it is that he wants. So go about I'm trying to get it using cunning and skill and in the same way that Esau does. So I don't think that pulls apart as we'd like to think when we first read that. Yeah. So you know, did you just change do something different to your mic or did you just move? No. Because uh -huh. it was a bit muffled for a bit, then he then it went clear. Oh, I don't know. Really. It's it sounds fine now. Like whatever you're doing now, just keep doing that. Yeah, I'm doing the same thing. Okay. Oh yeah, it was Can a bit. Say it again. Yeah, say it again and say it a bit slow because it, it, it did come out a bit more forced. So I couldn't catch what you yes, were saying. Yes, I, I I agree. There it, at the beginning it was a bit muffled. Okay, okay. It's interesting when you read um, this description of Jacob and Esau in contrast. It seems like Esau is the, if we're going to put bad and good on it, it seems like Esau comes across as the cunning, deceitful, you know, a, a bit bad, whereas Jacob is the plain, stay-at-home, good boy. And it seems like we're contrasting them, the, the way you've described plain there, as upright, perfect, undefiled, gentle and dear. It seems like he's the Christ-like one or the good one, uh, in contrast to Esau um, being fixated on hunting. But when we look at that description, it of Esau, you know, showing skill in achieving one's ends by deceit, it's describing Jacob. <laughs> it Amen, seems like yes. Jacob is not so clean as we'd like to think in that story, because as you, you said already, his name means supplanter, and he's, and you said about him trying to go about getting what he wants, he holds on to things, he wrestles for it until he gets it, it's that idea of getting his own end, you know, if it, whether it's his, the birthright, his wife, is, is the flocks from Laban, you know, th there's a whole series of things he wants to get that he gets through using deceit um, that we learn about later, you know, the idea of supplanting someone else. And so I think, for me, that 
it just opens your eyes that everybody's got issues, even the ones that seem to be okay. Um, mm-hmm. you know, it's not that clear cut. <laughs> yeah, yeah so... and I think because they were in the womb, I mean, really close, you know, twins, I'm sure they're going to get something off each other. I, I don't know. <laughs> I yeah, and they've got the same genetic makeup at the end exactly. of the day. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And if we see how uh, we're gonna see that how kind of Esau is kind of painted in a bad light and there's not much said about Jacob. You know, it's not is a lot of his defects and bad behaviour is is kind of not mentioned, not covered over. But it's there to dig out. It's there to find it. So if we read this next quote, EP one one well it's in a document. EP one one three point three. Jacob thoughtful, diligent, ever thinking more of the future than the present, um, was content to dwell at home, occupied in the care of the flocks and tillage of the soil. His patient, perseverance, thrift and foresight were valued by his mother. So all this his mother valued. Um, his gentle attentions added more to her happiness than the boisterous occasion, occasional kindness of Esau. To Rebecca, Jacob was a dearer son. So Jacob, he know, <laughs> he knew how to please his mother. <laughs> and this is this is his character. So this is probably I don't know probably why his wives loved loved him, especially Rachel. <laughs> um, he, he just knew how to yeah. please her. He was a man of the home, you know. Um, Yeah, so he had a he had a life at home, you know, with his mom. Um, but you know, we know that all this got disrupted, and he he kind of came off the path. But God had to kind of put direct him back on the path. Um, but we just see how his brother and it, Jacob and his brother, they are, you know, they have contrast personalities. But you know, even though this is a nice picture painted, you know, of Jacob. You know, you cannot hide the defects, you know. And it's, this is what I'm saying, you know, when we read and really dig into these stories, this is how you find the things that are lying underneath the surface. And we get to see the real Jacob or the real you, who you are, who you really are, you know. So, let's read this personal application. Um... Okay, no, let's not read that. So, what was the driving force of Jacob's life? It was a fear of Esau, and maybe others. But what I want to bring out is the fear of Esau. You know, um, so this is important to notice because as we are Jacob, we have to ask ourselves, what is the driving force of in our lives? You know. Like, we know what was driving Jacob to act in a certain way, make certain decisions. What's his, what what has been the driving force in our lives? What has led us to where we are now and and made us become who we are today? You know, so the fear of Esau caused Jacob to be on a run and not return home. And because of that, he got into more issues in the home where he was living, you know. You know, they didn't have to, you know, these things didn't have to happen. But the reason why things happen like that is because there was unresolved issues. You know, he was, he wasn't taught how to behave correctly. So he had bad behavior, relationship skills with people. You know, and he had, all, you know, he had fears also like of Esau. So um, these are the reasons why he ended up where he was and the situations he ended up in. When you said he wasn't taught, what do you mean? So, we see, it probably makes sense when we go further on that, how we how we behaved, you know, how we... Okay, I, I use one example, one one example. Favoritism. When he favoritizes mm. his son Joseph, where did... He was once favoritized by his mother. So he wasn't taught how to... He wasn't taught equality. 
This is why we don't see him practicing equality. He did, he wasn't taught how to serve. This is well. We'll get there when we when we go to East when we, when we get to um the de the deception. So he just we just see that he has bad relationship skills. So so uh, are you talk are you just incorporating the not so much the nurture yeah, the nurturing the discipline the upbringing of the children they weren't taught the basic um um basic things and you know behaviors uh, the way they talk are you talking just about the discipline bringing of the children yeah the, 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 the environment wasn't the environment wasn't um it wasn't any good Conducive. yeah it wasn't yeah but in a nutshell the environment wasn't good we see separation right. between okay. a mother and a father we see favoritism and that's not a you know, this is what he picked up, basically. This is what, this is what mm -hmm. was, he learned from this, basically. So um, it will become, I'll bring it, I'll bring more of that out as we go along anyway. So, okay, so, so with, with what we've just said, you know, so it's about, okay, looking at ourselves now. And seeing where can how can we relate so let me read this so we are the same there are things that have happened to us in our childhood which we've gone through um in previous studies you know things that have that's had an influence on had an influence on us you know had an influence on our lives today you know it's controlled our decisions in life it's had an influence on our behaviors our relationships and how we view ourselves and the world around us. So when we re when we review and look back at our, at our own lives, just like how we stood in the life of Jacob, so you'd be surprised on how childhood environments can shape who we are today, Cedric. Amen. Yeah. Uh, no, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know. <laughs> no. So many yeah. of us were not planted in a good environment or a good ground for the seed to flourish. You know, um, so the parable of the sower. So the environment where you, you know, so the good ground, the good environment, you know, where, you know, the soil is ripe, it's perfect. You know, where you receive love, you receive care, you get your needs met. You know, you're just being well looked after and, and well supported in life. You know, that's the good ground, you know, where we're supposed to, where, where we're supposed to be. But sadly, mm. many of us have been brought up in the bad ground or, you know, the bad environment, you know, where you may have been rejected. You know, you, you probably received, received a lack of affection, no confirmation that you're loved or wanted or valued, you know, where you've been emotionally abused. And if the soil is not right, you know, so if we know that if the soil is not right, if when we look, when, grow properly. yeah, so when we look at the parable, if the soil is not right, the growth is not right and you end mm -hmm. up being defeated by you know the forms of life you know that may be through friends siblings or even parents you know they made this chalk out of you every yeah. bit of self-esteem you know so you probably got none left until it's so low and you're just defeated and uh, and and if you haven't gone through the healing if you haven't gone through a healing process you know the symptoms will follow you and you know until you know your adult life until you know now and mm -hmm. with, then you just continue to see yourself or view yourself from like a childlike perspective from the perspective when you was affected how you viewed it back then as a child you know you view it the same way now you know but we may not realize we're viewing ourselves in a negative way but it's from the from our childlike perspectives when we didn't really know how to reason maybe or think so we view it from the same perspective you know and it's just a bad parable of a family model that many of us have been brought up into and this is jacob he's been brought up in a bad parable and then some blame god for why am i here why is this happening to me why am i like this but what i want to bring out is we need to look at the environment that will answer many questions why we are the way why we are 
why we are the people we are today and it, help, it helps us to understand how we've been shaped. So these stories like Jacob, he was brought up in a bad environment. We see what God done with him and what he was doing with him and where he was bringing him step by step in his journey. So even though he was brought up in a bad environment, God was progressively kind of transforming him and working with him step by step. So he wasn't neglected, even though the environment didn't teach him about God. God was still there with him, teaching him. I think it's a, a good point about the whole, the whole way that your environment shapes you and how we know from parable teaching that all the human beings we see around us, especially our parents when we first born, are examples of God to us because we're all yes. made in his image. And the way that those parents behave to you or that the actions they take, the decisions they make, influences your life. And, and then it affects your siblings, it affects your interaction with your siblings. And then that whole... That whole model is, is what you think God is like and how he behaves. So he's got mixed messages from his mother and father because his mother likes him, but his father likes Esau. And they're very different characters. And you might think, well, is that what God's like? God's, does God like both? What's God like? How does he treat people? And then when, Rebecca, when Rebecca tells him or influences him to, say, deceive his father, it's like, what picture of God does that give you? God's, hmm. God's okay with deception? Is he okay? I'm not. You know, it's all that. And yet yeah, Jacob knows it's wrong deep down. So there's these... There's this wrestling over the fact your environment's shaping you, but also God's trying to shape you and speak to you individually. And then he's trying to unpackage as you get older, he's trying to show you a true picture of who he is. And, mm. it's, and it's so hard because we have these dysfunctional human relationships that get in the way often rather than be a blessing. And they're supposed to be a parable to teach you about heavenly things and God, and they're just, just disruptive. You know, just, they're, not, um, mm. they're not perfect pictures. And so as you say, it shapes your whole worldview, your whole character, the way you, you operate, and so often you're blind to your own faults because of it. it's just your natural environment, it's what you're used to, it's how you're used to speaking and talking and um, behaving, and you've imbibed without realising it, these views of God and who he is and how to interact with fellow human beings, mm. and it's faulty, yeah, and it, it damages you. So our first parents and our first relationship is with our parents, and our parents represent God man and woman represent our father and our mother represent god and that's how we see god through the eyes of our parents through our experience with our parents yeah yeah and as um i'm um, so just made a comment in the chat that she says sometimes the soil becomes contaminated like pesticides which end up choking the plant or mm -hmm. makes the young plant grow up damaged and unable to fulfill the purpose of a plant to thrive and to give and be content so mm. and sometimes the pesticides is the character of the parents because they're not in Christ or they've got defects that they influence you with or pass on to you and it sh and it shapes you in a an unbalanced fashion. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, because many of us have been brought up in a broken home, these these things or dysfunctional these things can result in like it, it affects a walk with Christ, you know. These things may result in, you know, anxieties, you know, guilt, you know, um, depression and all types of issues, all types of symptoms you may suffer with because of our upbringing. Um, so let's go to the next quote. PP 178.2. Somebody want to read that? Where's Magda? She's very quiet. Okay, I can read that. <laughs> 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 so it's PP 178.2, is it? Yeah. Yes. Jacob had learned from his mother of the divine in intimation that the bright light should fall to him, and he was filled with an unspeakable desire for the privileges which it would confer. It was not the pos possession of his of his father's wealth that he craved. The spiritual birthright was the object of his longing. To commune with God as the righteous Abraham, to offer the sacrifice of atonement for his family to be the pro progenitor, progenitor of the chosen people and of the promised Messiah, 
and to inherit the immortal possessions embraced in the blessing of the covenant. Here were the privileges and honors that kindled, with, uh, kindled his most ardent desires. His mind was ever reaching forward to the future and seeking to grasp its unseen blessings. Yeah. So Jacob was told that the, je that, that the birthright was to be given to him and by his mother. Not by his father, but his mother made it known unto him. Um, if we read the next quote, um, I like this next quote. So, PP 178.3. With secret longing, he listened to all that his father told. I've got the absorbing interest. You got the what? The absorbing interest? Yeah. I was. Oh, 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 right. Sorry, that's like a heading. Yeah. Yeah, that's a heading. Yeah. So, that with secret longing, he listened to all that his father told concerning this spiritual birthright. He carefully treasured what he had learned from his mother. Day and night, the subject occupied his thought until it became the absorbing interest of his life. But while he thus esteemed in eternal above temporal blessings, Jacob had not an experimental knowledge of the God whom he revered. His heart had not been renewed by divine grace. He believed that his that the promise cons concerning himself could not be fully fulfilled so long as Esau retained the rights of the firstborn, and he constantly studied to devise some way whereby he might secure the blessing which his brother held so lightly, but which was so precious to himself. So there's a root here. Mm -hmm. um, so she brings out the absorbing interest of his life so the absorbing interest of his life what was that the birthright yeah so it became an absorbing interest of his life and she says day and night this occupied his thoughts so his thoughts day and night was on this and it was given to Esau and imagine how that feels actually you know when you got something that you really want and it's given to somebody else. You know, it's not nice. Mm. But this is what he was going through. And he held on to that which was dear and precious to him. It was like an investment. You know, like it was an investment. This birthright. He was told this is his. So this has became his obsession. You know, and it's given into the hands of Esau. So then, there's one thing I want to bring out. He says, it said, he believed, he believed that the promise concerning himself could not be fulfilled so long as Esau retained the rights of the firstborn. So I want to bring out the word believed. What does that word mean? You know, you know, when you believe in something, what does it cause you to do? To work towards that belief. So you because act. To act upon it. Yes. How many times have we believed something and we've just acted upon it? Yeah. Lots. And if you believe something, that means nothing's going to, nothing's going to wear with you. Nothing's going to shake you. Could you believe it? So you're just going to act on it. So this belief, it's a, is it a false belief? About the yes. promise, the belief is about the promise. Uh, uh, no, the, the the belief is is true, but the way he believed it was not true. No, so he said he says. I he, mean, not not the way he believed it. Sorry, his devising was was not was wrong. Yeah. So what he believed was he believed that the promise concerning himself, that the you know the birthrights for him, he said it could not be fulfilled as long as Esau retained the rights of the firstborn so he constantly studied to devise some way so because he believed that he couldn't get the the birthright as because he so held on to have held held rights to it so he felt like he had to um get it in his own strength 
So he believed. He didn't believe that God w was able to um, work things yeah. out. So he had to do it himself. So yeah. it's this belief. The question is with that, where does that come from? So where does he get that from? And, and Sophie put in the chat, what a huge pressure to know as a child. It almost robs you of being able to be free as a child and carefree. So Amen, exactly. This belief has come from his mother. And you wonder whether it was actually wisdom that she tells him that. Because mm -hmm. I've always thought, why did God tell him from an early age this birthright is going to be for you? When it damages him so much, it's just like Joseph telling him that he's going to be, you know, it's a dream. The brothers are going to bow down to you. It just makes the brothers hate him. You know, so you look at this and you think, this makes Jacob just constantly plot against his brother to get this birthright. Because he thinks if, if Esau is going to retain that birthright, he can't have a blessing. Now, God could have done something where they both got some kind of blessing, which is kind of what happened. But he doesn't have, whether he gets that view from his mother, whether his mother imprints that on it and says, you know what, it's really yours and he shouldn't have it. And, and it, without saying it, gives that impression. So then he thinks, yeah, he shouldn't have it. How do I get it from him? Mm. So he starts, this starts a train of thought. So this is so important how parents, what they tell their children and how they tell it to them. Because they leave, uh, because the child interprets it for the way often doesn't process what they're saying properly. Mm -hmm. So you, you've really got to be careful how you put um, things into a child's head. And, and you see this even with the Bible stories. When you read Bible stories to children, what they pick up from it is so different from what you get from it. You know, yes. you, you, know you see the story of David, and you think, yeah, he's called the enemy, and it's great, it's like a spiritual lesson. But to them, it's like, let's chop off the head of Goliath. And you think, well, exactly. that's not really what I wanted you to get from that. And yet it makes a big impression upon them and they go away with this picture that, and, and they build on that picture. And so this is a false belief of Jacob. It's a false belief. He, he's interpreted what it means to get the blessing. So she says, the blessing is yours. God wants to give it to you. And then he goes away and says, that means I have to get it from Esau. And we do that all the time. So we build up a false belief system and it's based on truth. And that's the worst thing. And we can see that, you know, with our, with our, our history, in our Christian walk, we have these truths about God that we read or promises we read and we interpret them in our own way. And then we go away with this belief system and we construct a belief system. And now God comes along and he says, I'm going to have to dismantle that. And it's so hard to dismantle it because it's something that's ingrained from your upbringing. And every impression that has been made has built on that false picture. So now he's looking at everything through those glasses. So every time Esau does something, he thinks, oh, you know, um, He's, he's suspicious, he wants that birthright, he doesn't really trust these boys. It builds that, it damages their whole relationship, you know, just knowing that one fact, that he should have got this birthright blessing. Uh, and it's really sad, because it's a good thing, and it's a good thing to want it, because it's spiritual, and it's, it's seeking after God. But the way he seeks after God is in his own strength, and in his own interpretation. And so many of us, we just can't get away, we obviously can't escape ourselves in the way we see things, but... To change it is so hard, even when people come along and tell you, this is a false way of looking at the situation. Don't do that. It's not the best. You know, we can't hear it because mm -hmm. we're so used to our own ways of thinking. Yeah. So, and that's a question. How do we read? So, looking at Jacob and how we, what he believed and how we acted upon the promise of God. How do we read? How do we read and act upon the promises of, of God? Is it in our own strength? I think one of the things that comes out of it for me, for Jacob, is that he's seeking constantly for his own good. He's not looking at how he can help Esau or bless Esau or, um, you know, it's all about him and what he wants. And that's how often we reason. So we, is that how he's acting on the promises of God? Yeah. So, so then we say a promise and we say, how can I fulfill this promise to myself? How can, how can I make this happen? How can I get hold of what God wants to give me? And we, we kind of, we, we do it on our terms in the sense that, you know, if you do this for me, God, you know, it's like, I'll trust you, I'll love you, I'll, I'll I don't know, it's, just, it's always so you mean selfish you mean that we have conditions. I mean, I mean, God has conditions to those promises, but I, I you know, when, when you told me, because when I was going through that and I was quoting Psalm 91 and mm -hmm. nothing was happening, uh, it's like, I mean, why do we have those promises then? How are we supposed to look at it? I think, good question. If you look at it in from Jacob's case, that 
he had to learn. Ellen White says he didn't have an experimental knowledge of God. So because he didn't have, a, have an experimental knowledge of God, this is why he acted the way he acted. Well, he should have known that, okay, God can override things. Okay, he should have known that, okay, his father is put a child who's not really a follower of God and is is gave him something sacred. So it's not really, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like his father's got a walk, having a walk with God. That's how it appears. But you know, if the, if, if the God said, this is for you, is it said and done? Because it seems like everything's going in contrast to what he's been taught. But we know, okay, if God said this, you know, he should have had faith. Like, I don't know if he was taught stories of his forefathers, you know, like the faith of Abraham and, you know, and even Isaac's stories, you know, from his childhood and that. He should have... Yeah, he, he probably it, was, because, sure if you, because if you read the story of Joseph, when Joseph was uh, sold into slavery... He was going away in the in the um, wagon. He started to think about all the things, you know, even of his grandfather and the things that his father had taught him. Yeah. So that kind of sustained him to be able to live in Egypt. Yeah. So it's probably. So maybe maybe Jacob's not probably. Um, what's the word? Putting faith into practice. Um, because I think you know, because it became a. You know when you obs when you when you know when you become obsessed with something, it can actually mess with your thoughts. It can mess with your day. Distort, yeah. You know, so what was he really studying? You know, day and night, he was studying how to get this birth right. That was his study, right. not the word of God. Right. So it's yeah. down, it's down to where your mind is at. Uh, what are you studying? Yes. Or are you studying something for your own selfish reasons? Are you studying for something for gain? But you're not really studying who God is. You know, so day and night. The insecurity Sorry? On Jacob. I think there's an insecurity as well. I think sometimes um, when I see this, you know, he's looking at his brother and he sees that, you know, his brother is doing all this stuff and it wakes an insecurity in himself. He's not secure in himself. And so I think when we try and do things in our own strength, it's because we don't believe we deserve it ourselves. You know, when I think about my own journey, when I try and do stuff for myself, it's because I'm like, God won't accept me as I am. So let me just do it myself, Lord. Don't worry. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough for your promises. And I think Jacob's parents set him up for that. And, you know, when we're young, we don't have the, the emotional capacity, the emotional, you know, if we are think about the brain as a muscle, it hasn't been worked enough. It's not grown enough to temper messages that we get and what we speak. So this is conflict between what Jacob is seeing, what he's hearing from his parents, and what he knows about God. And this conflict creates an insecurity in himself. And in my own life, I've seen that, you know. And it's only now, like I'm 33 years old. It's taken this long, with my own Jacob's time of trouble, to understand truly I, I knew and I read it, like just come to Jesus as you am, as you are, you know, parents tell you this, but you have this conflict in you and this conflict in insecurity. You said, Lord, I want to, I believe your promises, but I just don't believe them for myself because I'm not good enough, because this went wrong, because I've had to wait, because my brother has the birthright right now. And you become insecure and you don't believe that God's promises actually apply to you. And it's such a mm. sad position to be in. And I think that's why Christ, when, you know, the woman at the well, the woman that fell at his feet, those women, those women understood that their insecurity could be healed by Christ. And they just came as they were and just flung themselves at him. And I think we all need to get that point. I think Jacob had to get that point where he just remembered that even if he had a wrong idea, even if he didn't have, you know, what Esau seemed to have at the time, that God's promises are enough for us. We are worthy as we are. And I think it's our own personal insecurities, which are created in childhood by our parents, by what we see, that then become the blocking, almost like a screen that blocks us from actually believing that we deserve it. So then we just try and do it in our own strength. 
Mm. So we, we don't trust God initially. That's the basis of it all. We don't trust him. Yes. And I think one of the, one of the reasons for that is because of all the messages we've received. So, I mean, when you look at Jacob, it's understandable that he doesn't trust Isaac. He doesn't trust his own father because his father yeah. is constantly doting on Esau and doesn't seem to want to give the birthright to Jacob. And Jacob's thinking, he's got to want to give it to me. So there's two things have to happen. Esau has to let go of it. And you have to make him do that. And, and Isaac has to recognize, I'm the one who should get it. And he's not recognizing that. So Jacob's got this constant battle that he wants Isaac to recognize him and give him the blessing at the same time as trying to get it from Esau. And then you have to go back and say, why did God give that promise? And I think so often God gives the promises because he just wants to build a relationship with you. And, 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 and you have to trust this relationship of trust. He, wants, he just wants to be a friend. And so often we misinterpret why the promises are there, what they're for, what they, what they mean to us. So Jacob has a good promise here. It's a good promise. It was meant to be a blessing and a help to him. If, you, if we argue that Rebecca should have told him, then he should have seen it as, you know what, God's going to really bless my life. He's got a hand Amen, in it. I yeah. can really trust him and put my case in his care. And I don't have to go about, you know, after I should just love Esau for who he is and Isaac for who he is. I should, I should be securing those relationships because God ultimately has my interest at heart and he's going to bless me. And yet that actually, he twists that promise and he brings, makes it all selfish and, and tries to try and get it in his own strength. And so often that's what we do. We sort of come with our own slant on the promise. And we read it and expect him to do a certain thing. And when he doesn't meet our conditions, we, we, yes, don't trust. we immediately let go. We don't trust him. We don't um, rely upon him. And, and the whole point of the promise was for us to do that. And Satan comes in and, we, and I think he blinds us and we twist it. And so then it's like instead of actually generating faith in God, we lose faith because we say, he didn't do what I said when I wanted it. And it's yeah. You know, it's so conditional on the heart part. Yes. <laughs> it's like the minute anything goes wrong and we don't get what we want, we yes. faith and heart, and we, and we go into a pit, you know? Yeah. And all that is because we've grown up with faulty viewpoints of what God is like and how we operate. And so he's constantly trying to unmask the, the deceptions of the enemy that he's blinded us with to how to read even the scripture. And this is what we're learning in the movement, how read us now is really shaped your experience. How do you take that promise or that what that says and you say, thus says the Lord, this is what it means. And it's mm -hmm. a, it's such a wrong view of it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and yes, and then we, we're insecure because we're not safe in our walk with God because we don't trust him fully. We're a bit skeptical because, you know, look at Jacob with his parents. He's like, he can't really trust Isaac. And so he's got this faulty relationship with them that's just insecurities. And insecurities come about from that, yeah. Um, yeah. And as yeah. I read what Sophie's put, I think an insecurity has been instilled in Jacob, and fighting against an insecurity is so, so, so hard. Yeah, even when God promises us otherwise, I think Jacob believed, but his insecurity meant he didn't love himself enough to realize the promise applied to him, and mm. wrong views of ourselves. Yeah, so there's that as well. It's about you don't think you deserve it, you're not worthy. You know, you, why would God look at, you know, especially if other people around you give him that impression? Because one question is, you get from Isaac, does Isaac really value him? No, he values Esau. And then the same for Esau, what impression does he get from his mother? Does his mother value him? No, she values Jacob. So they're, they're vying for the attention of their parents without realizing it as well. Mm. And, and so there's that battle going on. That they're not secure. They should have two parents who love them both equally, and that, that would give them that security. Um, yeah. So Because as a child, you do trust your parents. Of course, you, you know. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that promise, if that was given to Jacob as a child, it would have been instilled in his head, and he would have thought, okay, this is what God's going to give me. So, you know, but somewhere along the line, it got distorted as you grew up, mm. because he, he changed the thought, oh, no, let me help God, I don't think this will happen, da, 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 da. let me do it this way. Mm. Yeah. So if we go to Luke 9.25, this kind of sums up Jacob's experience. For what is a man, so for what is a man advantaged? Or what does it gain a man, profit a man, if he gains, if he gain the world and lose himself or to, be, or to be cast away? So what does it gain a man to profit the world and lose his soul? 
So this principle, the principle of this verse we see in Jacob. So even though you know it was God's will for him to have the birthright, you know, we see Jacob going about it in in his own way, in a different way. And then what happens, just like what the verse says, it ends up being cast away. You know, he's a castaway. He ends up losing himself. You know, it destroys his home life. You know, he ends up on the run. Over the thing that he prayed for, the thing that he studied for constantly day and night, you know, over that false belief that, you know, he can he, he has he has to do this in his own strength. That little thing right there, that little belief right there, set him up, you know, for years, for years and years and years. Just that one little false belief. You know, if you just believe that God would do it in his own way, things would have worked out different. So what what I took from that is, you know, you can grab you can go after success, you can go after wealth, riches, whatever it may be, you know. But you realise that the way the way you go after these things, you know, you may find yourself, you know, um in a similar situation to Jacob, you know. Because in the process of, you know, going after these things, you know, you end up losing yourself. And then sometimes you have to lose yeah. yourself to find yourself. God's, Amen. you know, God has to say, listen, Amen. okay, you've gone through this, but let me teach you where you went wrong. And then let me help yeah. you find yourself again. And let me help you find me, find the real me, where you lost me back then. Yeah, so that we can find the real us. Me. Yeah, so we have to understand ourselves, and it helps us to yeah. understand who God is more. Yeah, I think the real and the, and the real hard thing about this story, I think, which we can really identify with, is the fact that he's not going after riches and worldly things. He's going after spirit, a spiritual a thing, and, yeah. and it's, it's a good thing. It's a good mm. thing he's doing, but he's doing it the wrong way. And this is, and he thinks he's serving God. He wants God. He thinks, well, I'm the good one. I'm the spiritual one. Why do you bless me, God? I want, I want to do what you want. And, and he, but he's trying to do it, and we see it so many times in his own way. And this is yeah. what we do. You know, we've been trying to serve exactly. God all these years, and we think we've been pleasing him. We think we've actually been doing it right. And we're saying, oh, we're good. You know, we're, doing, we're, we're seeking after the right thing. And yeah. yet he doesn't have this experimental knowledge of God. He hasn't, he's not really trusting God for who he is. He wants the blessing. He wants more than. He wants something more than just God Himself. He wants the blessing of being, you know, of having this birthright, of being someone, of being the leading the ancestor that's going to give birth to Christ. He's got all that and he, he wants it. Um, and you think on the surface that's a good thing, but there's so much self in there, and it's the same with us, there's so much self in there that's being built up and damages the message, damages the witness. You know, with conservative Adventism, the things we've imbibed about who God is and how to serve him, what that looks like, we think, oh, it's great, aren't we? We're the movement, we're doing God's service, we're doing all these things for God. And it's a, it's a, a damage. It's just causing damage. Yeah. And... So yeah, with Jacob, he's just doing these things and it's really damaging um, himself. And he doesn't realize that it's damaging himself. He's not actually um, walking with God in the way that God wants him to. And so now God's trying to bring him into that relationship with him. And he's trying to do the same yeah. with us. So what I've gathered... All that damage that's been done. Don't worry, I can undo it. I can help you if you let me. Take it from him. Yeah. If you look at his parents now. So his mom and dad, they're not... A... Uh, it doesn't seem like it, but they're not aware of his secret longings, you know, because his dad was kind of in in opposition to what was rightfully his, you know. So we see day and night the subject of the birthright absorbed his absorbed his thoughts. Um, we don't know what age this was. It's probably like went over for a couple of years, maybe we don't know, but we know that he was over seventy years old when he did commit the, the deception. So um so this is this is this was going on while his heart was not really fully set on God, you know, and his ways, you know, getting the birthright. You know. So this is a long build up to the deception. So in all those years of this preparation, this studying, you know, Jacob's being set in his ways, his character's being set and we see that Jacob he didn't have an experimental knowledge of experimental knowledge of God. So this was like one thing, one of the things that was missing from his experience, and we just when we draw it, when we bring it back to ourselves, when we compare ourselves with that situation, you know, it began with a thought, you know, things, 
things begin with a thought, a single thought, and then it escalates and escalates. You know, and this is a struggle that we go through. You know, not training our minds to dwell upon the things of God. Like Jacob, he wasn't studying the word of God day and night. Day and night was how to get this promise fulfilled in his own way. That was his constant study. So his mind wasn't really dwelt upon. Okay, how do I understand God? How do I learn of him or whatever it may be? And also not making God our constant study. And we end up just like Jacob, dwelling dwelling on the wrong things, obsessed over the wrong things until it becomes, you know, the driving force of our lives and it sets us up, you know, for our future. So this issue became a driving force of Jacob's life. So our false views of God can also make us make wrong actions and make bad decisions and but we need to remember that God is bigger than our bad decisions. God works you know, it works out all our corrections in the long run. Amen. But these things what we hold on to, the ideas that absorb our minds, that overpowers the word of God can end up crippling our walk with God and and not even see or understand why things are not right between why are things not right between me and God, you know, we don't realise how we think can really or what we've been taught can really cripple our understanding of God so it can be like so my question can it be with us have we have an experimental knowledge of God that we follow you know what things are absorbing our minds you know it can be spiritual things like what Emma said you know things that the Bible tells us to go after you know it can be posi leadership positions it can be I don't know doing good for people I don't know whether it may be teaching seeking a partner whatever it may be there could be good things but it's how we go about seeking these good things and getting these good things and I think that's what we need to dwell upon what how how God how would you like me to think you know sometimes we just got to ask the right questions to God how do you want me to think yeah. you know and I believe God will show us so mm -hmm. Yeah. The next part is the second act where, well, his first recorded craft is when he, um, he deceives Esau, where Esau sells his birthright. Let me just see how much I've got to say on this. Okay, we'll just do this last section. He's saying about experimental knowledge and really trying to understand what that means, that he didn't have this experimental knowledge because each of us need to know that we have that so we need to know what it is that he was missing you know that yes. he has got this experience with god this practical experience was not there and what does that look like because it seems like he's seeking after god and he wants godly things yeah but what is missing in his experience and i think ellen White answers that um the jabuk when you know when he's wrestling at the jabuk when he's is reviewing his life and his errors are, are passed before him and he learns he learns what that what the thing that was missing in his in his experience so i think right. that's a part of the experimental knowledge of god a lot of it for jacob is doing things in his own strength and not waiting on god to do things for, work things out for him and maybe because god doesn't work on our schedule you know we want god to work in our on our schedule you know in our mm. diary at one day God fulfill this Wednesday do this Thursday do that and if it's not done Lord you're not working for me you're not with me it seems like you're against me because these things I'm expecting is not being fulfilled and now I'm frustrated because you know because the things what you, you invest in you know yeah you, you build up you, you begin you develop an expectation and then if the ex expectation is not met it's you then it's frustration and disappointment and it's yeah. just that whole process normally we get it wrong where we expect God to do this in a certain way and at a certain time and I think there's a passage where Jesus said you ask but you receive not because you ask for this and mm -hmm. I think sometimes you don't receive because I was kind of using this analogy I had a real kind of like moment with Jesus where he showed me something yesterday and I think it's because we're still not real with God. We still put on our act when we're speaking to him, when we're praying with him. And <clears throat> you see that, like, if we use the analogy of a doctor, if you go to the doctor 
have to be real with your symptoms. Otherwise, you can't help you. And you know that you tend to say the sin are sinners. And he says the same that, you know, they don't, those who are well who need a physician, those who are sick. I think sometimes we lie about our symptoms when we speak with God. We mm. come before him and it's a very formal chat. We don't mm. break down like the woman at the well, the woman mm. that caught in adultery, the friend that was lowered down. You see, in all of those instances, those people came to Jesus as they were broken, miserable, insane, and he could help them. But I think personal application, Jesus showed yesterday that I don't come to him as I am. I don't come to him as, you know, vulnerable, scared, messed up, broken, you know, overthinking, Sophie. I come to him, I try to come to him polished. So he can't give me that promise that he's promised. Because like a doctor, if I go to him with fake symptoms of suppressing my symptoms, how can he give me the right remedy? He can only go by what I'm telling him. Even though the doctor might have a suspicion, a good doctor can only go by what you tell him. And I think we need to get to that point where we can be vulnerable. And I think we see that in Jacob's later life, in the night of wrestling, he's tired, he's weak, and then and only then he becomes truly vulnerable with Jesus. And I've learned yesterday, you know, he showed me that says, yeah, you can be yourself with me. I'm, I'm holding your hand. Don't be scared to be yourself. The world might reject you. I know you've got a fear of rejection. You know, I know you've got a fear of perfectionism. You want to appear that you've got it all together. I've got your hand. Face your fear with me. Be vulnerable with me. Just be yourself. And it was just so beautiful in doing that because suddenly I realized what was holding me back all of these years from experiencing God is I wasn't allowing myself to be vulnerable. Imagine, I'm putting an act up in front of my creator. He knows everything mm. about me. But yeah. I'm still putting on an act when I go to him, you know, because yeah. I still feel like, because I had this fear of rejection, it's so deep, I feel like maybe even God will reject me. Mm. Of course he won't. He said he will in no way cast mm. me out. But it took me mm. believing that to then come to Jesus and say, if I know you're not going to reject me as the quite pathetic <laughs> Sophie that I am because you love that version of me and that's always what I've been seeking that acceptance of who the real broken Sophie is and I think sometimes that's what stops us experiencing God's promises our own inability to be real with him yeah and you know what mm-hmm. I've had to <laughs> so would you finished yeah oh yeah with that um, I've had to I think we all ever have to go for an experience when it comes to just being coming to God as we are. Yes. You know, um, and I've really learned that it's this year. Like, I mean, I remember like it took me years and years. You know, you know, you, you know, when you have certain issues, and well, for me, it's like I used to think, you know, this is embarrassing. If I can't tell my brethren, but. I feel like I can't even tell God because I wonder what he what what he thinks. This is like embarrassing. Like, why am I like this? Why do I think like this? And it's like I couldn't be, I couldn't really go deep into that mm. issue with God. I couldn't really tell him as it was like plainly, you know, put up my whole heart. What's there? You know, tell God every little de- bit of detail and say, Lord, this is it. You know, I felt like I can't, I couldn't do it until, you know, God allows you to go go to go through certain experiences where, for me, I had to really so be open and so vulnerable with God, so to the point where you know I'm telling Him everything, every little thing, mm. and even you know in the dark moments, you know like you know like Elijah when he went into the cave, you know when when he went to the cave of depression, like he was so honest with God. He said, "Lord, just kill me." I mean, I, I mean, Lord, I want to die. He was the man, the man was. He just wanted to die in his experience. He just wanted he wanted to literally die, and he was so vulnerable. He he just told God that, yeah. and not many of us can really. I've not for myself. I realized I've never been so vulnerable with God. But I've had to learn in trial that when you tell God how it is, like fe- you know, when you just go through therapy with God, when you go through counseling with God, He can really work with you and show you. Okay, let's work with that. What He just said, let's just work with that. Okay, you feel like this, you've gone through this, 
okay now you've confronted it now with me you're not hiding it you're not masking it you've confronted it now now we've got something to work with because what you were telling me before we can't work with that because because that's not you i can't work with somebody i'm not working with i'm not working with you trying to pretend to be esau i want to work with you being you who you are and i want to help who you are your jacob your leon your sophie you know so let me work with sophie not the person you're trying to pretend to be because i'm a i'm a personal god so let's work with you and i've got to learn through that through experience and once even 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 in the bitter moments where you're just bitter even if you're bitter with god you know this lord this is how i feel change my perspective change you know help me sort out my feelings and my emotions because right now it's out of balance and i want you to pull it back in balance but you gotta be honest if it's how you feel you let god know how you how you feel that's what i've learned but that's what, for me anyway it's really, really important, and I think I remember having this moment where, when I've been Adventist for a long time, and I'm praying to God, and you, and you, you know, if you brought up in a Catholic background, where you just say, Our Father who art in heaven, and you come to God, and you say these set prayers, and you're doing that, and I'm not, not, not saying that I was saying Our Father, but I'm saying a kind of formal prayer, and I'm saying, you know, Lord, help me with this today, or do that. And I'm suddenly thinking, and I don't remember how it happened, but I remember reading Steps to Christ about, you know, talk to God as to a friend, and I have this problem, and I'm thinking, why do I, say, you know, how do I deal with this thing? And I'm covering up. It's exactly what you're saying, Susie. You come to God, and you put on this act, because from day one, when you're born, you 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 learn how to put a persona across to people about this. Mm. I want to be. This is what I'm really like. When you're not really, because you have to put on a front to be liked, to be loved, to be mm. accepted. You have to behave a certain way to please people. And so that desire to be loved and accepted is so great in each of us, and it's meant to be there. But we we we, we see we're faulty. We see other people are faulty. We have to, and we start acting, and we see our parents acting. We see everybody acting because mm. nobody knows how to be real. Nobody knows how to you know exactly. how to walk with God. We don't know how to navigate this journey of life. No one's trained us how to do it. Yeah. And this is a problem we've got in the movement. People are similar, but anyway, um, that's a separate issue. But. Yeah, we're not honest with ourselves, and that's the yes. biggest problem we've got, because we can't see, we don't really want to say who we really are, because we don't know, mm. well. we're not even sure what our identity is, because we've masked it so badly, and then we come to God, and we say, we don't even know how to be honest with them, exactly what you're saying, so I'm saying all these formal prayers, and I realise, you know what, if I had a friend right here, I'd be saying, you know, I feel this about this person, I'm really struggling, because I've got this issue, and so I just started to talk to God in a different way, and it's just such a different experience, because you realise that actually he does understand, actually he can take your burdens, actually um, to have to be really honest with him because it will help because I'm just saying, you know what, I really don't like this person, what am I going to do, Lord? But then what happens is, you, you start to communicate with God like that and you have, you have a really close walk with God but then views are taught or preached to you that you're not allowed to do certain things, you're not allowed to be this yes. way, you're not allowed to be depressed, for instance. It's a sin to be depressed. So now when you're feeling depressed, you don't even want to go to God and say, Lord, I'm feeling depressed because it's a sin. And he might just say, you're wiped out. You can't do that. You're yeah. victorious for that because you can't, you can't have depression. So true. You have depression. And if you've been raised with someone shouting or telling you off, it's like God's going to tell you off. If I go to him and say, I've got depression. Well, what's coming to me? You know, if you've had the faulty disciplinary upbringing and all that's added to your view your, your of God. And I'm not saying I have particularly, but I just see how, how I process it as a Catholic. You know, if you do one, one wrong thing, you're going to burn in hell. It's like mm. that, that kind of view of God is like, I can't tell him I'm doing something wrong. And if you and, and the very thing that you've got a problem with, the depression, you can't give it to him, then you're crippled because you're stuck with it now because there's nowhere to take it if you can't take it to God. And I think that's what Sophie's saying. If you can't be honest about those things, you carry them with you. You can't get rid of them because you can't tell him, this is my issue. Mm. I've got sexual problems. I've got anger problems. I've got whatever they are. And they're so gross even to yourself. You think, I don't even want to go there and look at it in myself. I don't want to see it. And this is Laodicea. They don't want to see what they're really like because they're mm. in sense. they have to be. They're, they're God's they have to be rich and They have to be perfect. You have to yeah. be perfect. And you can't even admit to yourself that you've got issues, let alone to God and then to your brethren. And so it's just a knock-on effect. But the first thing you have to do, like you say, and I think really has gone through this, you have to be honest with God. You have to open yourself up to God. Mm. Um, and I think the whole way we've been taught as conservative Christians is you can't do that. You, you just can't because you've got to be perfect. You've got to be a certain way. Mm. You've got to behave a certain way. You've interpreted Ellen White's writings in a certain way. 
that say you're not allowed to do this, that, and the other. I mean, even the thing about you're not allowed to talk to a counsellor, you know, because it's, it's trusting in a, in a man. And that very model is faulty because parable teaching tells you you've only got men to relate to people, human beings. And so um, you need to talk to people as well. That's the whole point because they're like God. <laughs> mm. um, and yeah, it's, it's really damaging. And so that honesty is so important and because we're not willing to see. And I know I've said this to elder, I've spoken to people and I said, well, I want God to open my eyes and see what, you know, what my idols are, what's my problem. And they said, you know, don't you see what it is? Can't you really see how many people said, or can't you really see it, but do you want to see it, kind of thing. And I, I think that's so true. If Jacob had had his eyes open, he would have gone to God and said, I want this birthright, but I'm going to trust you how to get it. What do you want me to do? You know, how do you want me to see this thing? How do you want me to operate in this environment? Um, and he would have, yeah, I don't know how it, I'm just constantly questioning how he have done it differently, how should he have done it, what should he have done? Because that's our position. You know, there, there must be mechanisms around you to be able to see this is the way to go and this is what I'm like, but we don't want to see often because it, either because it's painful or because we'll be judged, you know, other people will think less of us. There's all sorts of reasons why we don't want to face up to our, then we have to accept responsibility because it's easy to blame our faulty parents for our bad behavior. But when we start seeing we're doing something bad in the moment, it's like, oh, am I really that bad? Isn't, isn't brother X worse than me? Why am I... You know, we have to blame others for our faulty relationship. That's what we want to do. Instead of actually taking the onus and saying, oh, I'm not as good as I thought I was. This is awful. <laughs> you know, especially if you're in a marriage or if you're in a you know, close relationship with anyone, even if you live with them, you can say, oh, it's all their fault. This goes wrong. But you have to take responsibility, and it's scary. Yeah, and you mentioned insecurities also. Um, and I think, you know, when you have, like, severe insecurities... You know, like, oh, these people are judging me, or this. If I be like, if I be this way, I won't be accepted, or if I say this, I'll be mocked, or if I open up, people will maybe reject me, reject me, or whatever it may be. And then, how we think about how how we think people would behave towards us, it can, for some, uh, for me, for me, in the past, I used to think. God will think the same way about me, so you know what? I can't really tell him how I'm feeling in the moment. I can't really tell him how what I'm experiencing because he's gonna think I'm silly or he's gonna. Because if I feel like if I feel awful, if I feel stupid, or if I feel a negative way about myself, God's gonna feel think the same way. So I can't really talk to him because he's gonna give me the same reaction. Other, pe- I, I believe other people may give me. And then that's kind of a barrier to being open to but express yourself like, with God. Sorry. Yeah, it kind of it's like a barrier what people what we can put up, you know, when it comes to approaching God, telling Him how things really are inside. But, but isn't it like uh, Paminda was saying about uh, a paganism? We, you know, we in that Babylonish kind of mindset where we um, uh, have to always appease God. Um, uh, so it's it's almost like righteousness by works. We we, we got that kind of mindset, and we um, do it, it. You know, like offering this and offering that, and doing this and doing that, and it's all our way. It's not actually taking on God's way. And I think it, it's you know being vulnerable is 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 not a weakness. It's a strength. But a mm. lot of us. We, we see it as weakness because we see it as people judging us or people thinking, oh, yeah, I knew she was always like that or this and that, you know. So um, in that kind of atmosphere, we also think that's how God is. That's how God will be towards us. He'll judge us too. He'll say, oh, this is good that she is like this. But there's strength in our weakness. Mm. Yeah, and, that, and in fact, I think it's a, point, a good point you're all making, really, is that we, we behave towards God like that because we've been judged by people. So the way people have treated us in the past has all given us a view of God that is, we think is the same because that people are our terrible for God. So if you've been growing up and you've done something, you've been treated badly for it, you've been judged, you've been criticized, you've been punished um, for something in a wrong way, then you can see how important it is the upbringing and the disciplining of a child. 
if they had got a correct mm. picture of how God disciplines and the loving kindness and mercy and redemptive discipline all the time, if they got that consistent picture, then you would not be scared to go to God because you'd know that he is, he accepts you, he forgives you, he's there for you, he'll never let you down, he'll never betray you, he'll never beat you up, you know, he'll never do anything that's against your interest. But because we've been bombarded with people doing things to us selfishly and in the wrong way, we've got a wrong picture and then we don't trust God because he's, mm. he's going to judge us the same way, he's going to condemn us. And it, yeah, it's... Yeah, and, you, and you'd be free to be yourself if people around you accept you whatever you did, like God does. On one level, of course, he doesn't just condone sin, but he's always seeking to get you to race to a higher place. And, Amen. and that's how people should have been to you. And because they weren't, you, now you've got fear. You've got fear that we're going to be judged, rejected, yeah. because people have rejected and judged us, because they're faulty just like us. Um, so the time, um, that's been mindful of the time now. It's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've got to... Let's wrap up now. Yeah. So to summarize, um, so we've been looking, you know, at the life of Jacob, and we just took, we're just at the beginning still, to be honest. Um, so we began with the with the um, with the birth, you know, the experience he was going through, you know, in the womb, you know, the wrestling he was going through, and it kind of marks his character. Like we see this wrestle, f you know, throughout his life, you know, this struggle. You know, um, we've seen his life in a home, how he was as a child. You know, um, we've seen how his mind operated, how he thought. You know, the, the, we've seen, you know, his mistakes, what he made. You know, we've seen how he didn't have an experimental knowledge of God, but all this had a consequence. You know, we've seen how his thoughts escalated into actions and his actions escalated escalated into you know <coughs> bad consequences what led him you know to be a cast out to be a castaway um so with, with all this we've seen how we can really see ourselves as jacob you know in these scriptures and it's a blessing to be able to read the bible like this and and be able to kind of pinpoint who you are and how you can relate so um, we'll continue next week, and we'll pick up we'll pick up from where Jacob and Esau have the interaction with the um with the pottage. So we'll continue from there next week. Sorry, on Wednesday. And um, mm. so we may take a couple of um you know sessions to to complete the whole thing. But I think it's a blessing anyway um to be able to yeah, go through these be. stories like this. So um, with that, shall we pray? Yes. Does someone want to pray? Yeah, I'll pray. Take heart of Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time and we can come um, in the early hours of the morning, but just to open one another, Lord, each of us has grown up in a world where we have been encouraged not to be ourselves, to hide who we are, Lord. We've been taught that our vulnerabilities, Lord, make us weak, but Lord, you promised us that when we are weak, then, you are, then we are strong, Lord. Then you can rest upon us, Lord. So I pray for every soul here. I thank you for Leon's heeding of your call to have us, your people. Um, Yes. Deal with our issues, Lord. And I just thank you that we all, myself and then my sisters, have made that choice to come up um, and have an appointment with you this morning and bear our infirmities with one another. Lord. For often we have an act, a dance, a carefully learnt and choreographed dance that we do with one another, Lord. And I just pray that, Lord, as we enter this upper room, Lord, and we come to each other as we are broken, insane fearful, troubled, Lord. that in those experiences, Lord, that we would have a deeper love for each other and that we would accept one another as the broken, confused, as scared children that we are, Lord. And in doing that, Lord, we then learn that we can come to you, Lord. I pray for everyone in this movement, Lord. I pray for everyone that will watch this podcast or listen to it. I pray that they would know, Lord, that they can enter this upper room wherever they are as well, Lord. We invite them into this upper room, Lord. And we ask them to 
lay down their burdens with each of us, Lord, with whether they are in this their prospective country, Lord. And I just pray that they would come to you. I pray the lessons that we have learned, the ill guidance that we have learned, just like James said, be so, Lord, the things that we have heard that have made us insecure, Lord, have made us have a wrong impression of you from childhood, Lord. So we would now speak to them, Lord, we're about to go to a world of church, Lord, that is crying out for this, Lord, crying out finally, Lord, know that they can be accepted. And I think that's just the beauty of the kingdom, Lord. You're not looking for people who are, you know, whole and have it all together. And you're looking for people who just understand, Lord, that they need to just be themselves. Lord, but a lot of us don't even know who ourselves are. Thank you for the studies three of us during the day. I pray for everyone right now who's been struggling to find who they are, Lord. Keep us faithful. We know that whenever we have a deep connection with you, the enemy will come to try and take away this food that has been planted. We send your angels and your Holy Spirit to guide us now as we go about our day.